Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. And, and obviously, I have my own introduction slides as well. So hi, we're uh, AS5559. Uh, currently, uh, a bit of empty space on the internet. But um, yeah, my name is Frank Bredek. I'm head of CSERT. Uh, I'm also a researcher. Um, and uh, two years ago, I initiated something called the Netherlands Security Meltpunt because I was unhappy about how we exchange security information in, uh, in the Netherlands. And that little joke uh, turned into what's now called the DIVD C-Cert uh, because I, uh, I joined forces with, uh, with DIVD. So if you want to reach me in that um, persona, uh, here's how to. Uh, others may know me uh, through, uh, through this AS, which is obviously Atom86 and not Schubert Phyllis, but uh, Schubert Phyllis is the master company of, uh, uh, yeah, the mother company of, uh, of Atom86. And there I'm the, I'm the CISO, but I'm here to talk to you uh, about DIVD. Um, so, so just out of curiosity, who, who knew about us? Uh, okay, that should have been more, so it's good that I'm here. Um, yeah, um, there was this little ransomware thingy with a, with a company called Kaseya. They make software, software used by managed services company um, like Schubert Phyllis, but lucky for me, not Schubert Phyllis. Um, and they had a security problem. There was a zero day vulnerability in their software. And it turned out that, well, actually there was more than one zero day vulnerability in the software. And it turned out that through their software, um, you could take it over and then the handy thing with, with remote system administration tooling is that you can administrate a lot of other tooling. So for instance, Co-op in Sweden had to close 400 of their 800 supermarkets. Um, there were other companies that were in, in a lot of trouble. A lot of people had to work that weekend, which was um, especially disappointed if you were American because they timed the attack to coincide with um, um, uh, Independence Day. 4th of July. Um, and we were talking to Kaseya previously. We nearly prevented it. We, we managed to prevent some damage by telling them about the vulnerabilities. Uh, they were already working on a patch. And if they hadn't been working on a patch, and if we hadn't been scanning the internet to find these servers, uh, then cleaning up the mess would have taken even longer. Uh, but you also may know us from um, our, uh, our chairman, who, uh, who managed to obtain the password of um, Donald Trump, twice. Um, our involvement in the Citrix um, crisis, which was the, the little crisis before we all went home uh, to, uh, to face uh, Corona, um, and, and other stuff. Um, so DIVD, Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure. Dutch, does that mean we're only doing things for the Netherlands? No, it's more about a mentality. Open, honest, collaborative, for free, run by a bunch of volunteers on a budget of, of a shoestring and a packet of gum, um, but with an international reach, because we think that really national boundaries are pointless on the internet. They, they, they exist, but they don't exist. We're an institute. Um, in two years, we've grown from four people with a wild ID to a fully fledged organization of over 60 people uh, with a board, um, a CISO, a privacy officer, an advisory board consisting of people who are uh, quite known in this, uh, in this world, and three uh, branches. Research, a CSERT, and uh, an academy, which opened uh, recently, all underlined by a code of conduct. And that code of conduct is important because in my day job, I, I have a word of advice for colleagues who inadvertently think it's a good idea to scan others. It's like, well, when you do that, I have three things that I think are important. Permission, permission, and permission. And then lesson two is a recap. Did I remind you that I find permission important? But as DIVD, we scan everybody and we're not asking for, uh, for, for permission. And we're not just scanning, we're actually trying to find vulnerabilities. And sometimes by finding vulnerabilities, you have to 
exploit them in a way that is safe to do. And that's a dilemma. We're, we're literally coloring, to, to use a Dutch metaphor, uh, we're coloring on and sometimes over the edges of what's uh, really allowed by law. But we do it with good intentions, and we try to keep it proportional. So, for instance, DDoS vulnerabilities are very hard for you, because I think I would have a lot of, lot of issues with, well, quite a big part of this audience if I took people's network down while scanning. Uh, so, code of conduct, really important to us. And then we deal with vulnerabilities. And what kind of vulnerabilities do we do? Well, we've got three kinds of cases. Uh, we deal with uh, critical vulnerabilities, so things where is the internet on fire goes, yes. Um, we deal with data leaks and victim notification there, and we deal with, uh, with zero days. So to zoom in on critical vulnerabilities, uh, well, we had the case with the, with the Citrix crisis. And in the Citrix crisis, um, yeah, we had Citrix Netscaler, which is a product to keep people uh, secure, to facilitate secure access to the internet, uh, or to company networks, not to the internet. So it's a way to get well, to do remote working, what we've all been doing for, for a year and a half. And it turned out it contained a nasty flaw. If you had that product to secure in the network, you were actually not that secure. Um, we had a minister who was telling everybody that if you hadn't patched for this vulnerability, you were a pancake. Uh, no, sorry, you were an, uh, an oily ball, an oily ball, a Dutch, a Dutch traditional New Year snack. And we actually had a number of researchers who had sent a list with all the vulnerable servers to the National Cybersecurity Center. So how can you call people Olibola on the one hand, and on the other hand, have a list of those people and not tell them that they're actually vulnerable? Well, there's a whole political landscape behind that. Um, but in the end, the Citrix uh, resulted in a physical effect. We had genuine Citrix feelers, Citrix traffic jams on the road. Turns out that if everybody who uses, who normally works at home, goes to the office, the Dutch road system can't handle it. Uh, Pulse Secure, another case that we ran, um, had to do with uh, Pulse Secure VPN appliances. And again, it turned out that those things weren't as secure. And there is a theme emerging at the moment. And then, uh, yeah, the, the most current case, uh, proxy logon, um, and it's followed by proxy command, proxy token, proxy oracle, um, basically a new attack service on exchange servers. Uh, it turns out if you haven't patched your exchange server since July, um, what are you doing here? You should go home and, and, and do it right now. Well, you should go to your office and, and do it now, or log in. Well, watch this talk and then log in and, and patch your exchange server. Um, because it's, it's an insecure product. What do we do in these cases? We scan the internet um, soon from, uh, from our own AS. Right now, we, we back steal and borrow VMs from uh, people who provide them to us. And we scan the internet trying to find vulnerable systems and, uh, and inform the system owners. And then we do victim notification. Um, victim notification uh, of people, of cases where we find credential dumps. Um, we have a lot of researchers, security researchers, who are part of DIVD, and every now and then they find something. And it turns out that being a cybersecurity expert is not a guarantee that your system is secure, but being a cyber criminal is also not a guarantee that your own systems are secure. So sometimes people have a command and control server and then they have an Elasticsearch database with all their victims in there that they're trying to, uh, trying to exploit or have exploited and extracted their data and they haven't secured that. Or they leave their log files in open directories and you can get from those log files you can get whatever they stall. So what we tried to do in, uh, in case of the warehouse bot, for instance, was actually notify these people. And it gets you very interesting conversations. Um, conversations where people 
you send them an email, hey, listen, we found this on the internet for you. This is a list of your passwords. By the way, for safety, we, we always put asterisks, uh, so we mask parts of the password. And the reaction is, um, bleep, you scammer. Um, no, I'm not the one trying to scam you. I'm trying to tell you that you're, uh, you've been scammed and, and you have this problem. Um, sometimes we actually manage to, to convince them. Sometimes we don't manage them to convince them. Um, if we do convince them, then it's like, oh, what should I do? Well, we put some advice in the, in the emails, luckily. Um, sometimes you send out an email saying, hey, we found this compromised data in your email account, and it turns out that one of the things compromises our email account. So as a nice thank you, you get some malware from the scammers trying to infect you right back. Um, sometimes you hear nothing. Sometimes people get upset. Um, all seven stages of, uh, of grief come by. Um, yeah, and, and, and we've, we've had three cases now, so we've, we've notified people about um, Mirai devices in their network that have been compromised. Uh, Mirai compromising IoT technology like um, DVRs, digital video recorders, and other, other stuff that are still available across Telnet with default credentials. There's so many things wrong in that sentence. Um, Telegram, uh, we're in Telegram groups where things get shared. Um, yeah, and a lot of people find it very difficult, especially public agencies find it very difficult to deal with this kind of information because there's a huge privacy aspect. So mailing everybody the whole database of credentials is not something we try to do. Uh, but divvying it up and, and working with other people to, uh, yeah, to share this data in small volumes is, uh, is something we do. Yeah, and then the juicy part, the zero-day vulnerabilities. Um, a zero-day vulnerability is a vulnerability that you know about but um, was patched zero or less days ago. Um, so basically there is no patch for it yet. Um, so far, we've got three cases running where we found these things. Uh, Vembu BDR, which is a backup solution, which is really nice if you can compromise a backup solution if you're, uh, if you're an evil hacker. Uh, because backup solutions typically back things up that are important to an organization. So you know that if it's backed up, if it's reachable from the backup appliance. Um, yeah, it must be good. It must be worth something. Um, Kaseya VSA. Uh, virtual system administrator, I, I talked about that before, and Kaseya Unitrends, which is the backup solution uh, built by Kaseya, um, which is uh, yeah, similar to, uh, to Vembu. Uh, so in these cases, our researchers, uh, in their spare time, uh, sitting on the couch next to their wife while watching uh, Netflix or something, uh, were playing around with these, uh, this software and found vulnerabilities in them. And that's bad news. And then I come to the disclosure process. And the disclosure process um, for us um, yeah, is what it's all about. Because our mission is to report vulnerabilities we found, find in the digital systems to those people who are in a position to fix them. Um, yeah. And then in the Netherlands, we have something that's called a London like Deckenstelsel air quotes, mine, uh, but isn't actually that, that fully covering. It doesn't cover everything that we do. So, um, yeah, we have to rely on, on for instance, uh, the Whois database, which is, um, how should I put it politely? It could be better. Um, but we do need your help there. Um, to allow our scans to go through. So if you see a scan from us, um, yes, obviously the good thing would be to, con the, one of the things you could do was to contact abuse at divd.nl. Um, this is not abuse, this is what we do. Um, the other thing you could do is, is allow the scan through and um, if you get an email from us, please forward it. We often don't know who's behind an IP address. Um, you have a contract with these people, hopefully. Uh, so hopefully you do know who's responsible for this bit of, uh, of network space. And uh, hopefully we can, uh, yeah, we can get to you and, and, and get you some, uh, 
get, get some help, get these people informed, and get them to fix their vulnerabilities so the internet becomes a little bit of a safer place. Critical vulnerabilities in the Netherlands, we work with partners as well, trusted information sharing partners, um, organizations like uh, NBIP, connect to trust the NCSC, DTC, CSER, DSP, the Anti-Abuse Network, um, yeah, just about uh, anybody that, that wants to work with us uh, and, and can actually get us in contact with people sooner. Um, via the network provider, sometimes we can go directly. I mean, things sometimes have an SSL certificate or a TLS certificate that actually says, hey, this belongs to this organization. Well, in that case, we don't need to bother you. We'll, we'll go directly to them. Uh, but finding out who's responsible for fixing systems is, a, is sometimes an issue. Because if you send an email to info at um, Mosaic Theater, um, will the person who reads the info address uh, actually understands us? And internationally, we often go through the network provider or go directly. In case of victim notification, we try to, to approach the victims. So if, if it's a nice combination of an email address and a password, well, we'll email that email address. Um, we try to, to report it to the site operator. So if it says the Facebook password of this person is that, then we try to, uh, to report it to Facebook. Um, and we're trying to work together with the No More Leaks initiative. Uh, but um, yeah, that's still, uh, still, still uh, being formed. Yeah, and with zero days, we try to stay within the coordinated vulnerability guidelines, uh, which roughly says 90 days after, uh, gives the vendor 90 days to fix a vulnerability, and then some sort of disclosure happens. Um, so we work with the vendors, we try to be nice, we try not to be too aggressive, uh, we take the 90 days as a guideline, because we think it's better to breach news about vulnerabilities if there's something you can do against them as well. Uh, otherwise, it's like, um, this is your captain speaking, the left wing is not on fire. Um, yeah, and afterwards, it just becomes a critical vulnerability, meaning scanning the internet, trying to identify the vulnerable systems and, and going through to the system owners or through the network owners. And like with Kaseya, sometimes our hand is forced and an investigation into a zero day that nobody knew about turns into an investigation and a help and an aid operation in the biggest ransomware attack uh, ever recorded. So important three parts, research. We have researchers, the CSERT and the Academy. Research is there really to find vulnerabilities, to define scanning methodology. Scanning the entire internet is, uh, is not easy, um, not to mention IPv6, which we still haven't solved. So anybody with good creative ideas on, on, on what we can do there, um, yeah, come see me. Finding zero-day vulnerabilities. Yeah, so, so I get an advice, donate a, donate a server to pool.mtp.org. It, it will get you a good enumeration of what IPv6 space is in use. And uh, we'll take that tip. I think it's one of the servers that's going to go into our AS then. Um, CSERT, it's about triage. Is something worth going through um, to do an investigation on? Because we do this in our spare time um, besides day jobs, and we're security people, so we're not we're not searching for things to do. We, we, we've got enough to do already. Uh, publication on our website, ccert.divd, managing.nl, managing vendor relationships, and reporting out the vulnerabilities. And then the academy, um, heroes don't scale. Um, so we're trying to get, um, give some guidance to the younger people out there. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm one of the, yeah, one of the old school hackers that's around there, but we got plenty of young people around who want to learn. And we want to encourage them to learn, but we also want to encourage them to do the right thing and not end up with a criminal record or, um, or a jail sentence or, or, or on the wrong side, because I think the, the dark side has enough people already. 
So that was the plenary part of, of, of what I was uh, about to talk. So if you've got any questions um, that you don't want to, to uh, ask here, then um, this is a way to do it. Um, but yeah, let's open up the floor. Thank you, Frank. Now we have more than plenty of time to answer some questions. Uh, just to be sure, we do appreciate the comment from the room just now, but for the benefit of our online viewers, please go to a microphone if you have something to say. Uh, then next time everybody can hear it. Um, I guess uh, um, there was one question from IRC. There is also something <laughs> with the YouTube uh, stream. It is um, unfortunately not possible to place comments on the YouTube stream. Uh, because apparently, uh, uh, as soon as you start streaming, you cannot uh, open the comment section anymore. So we had to do that before, or we need to stop streaming. I don't know, whatever. Or, or you tell me. Or open two browser windows. <laughs> um, go to IRC for your questions. Um, I think uh, we'll go to the uh, room questions first. And if uh, the light isn't failing me, this is Jan on the microphone. Back to his old habit. Thank you very much having you back, Jan. It's great to see you again. What is your question? <laughs> Hello, uh, Jan Jorsz from Six Connect. Uh, thank you for this. Welcome. Um, I think you're you're doing a really really good job. Thank you for doing it. Uh, but um, uh, what I saw in your presentation was just IPv4 addresses. Are you also doing stuff on IPv6? Are you scanning on IPv6? And if you do, how do you approach the scanning? Thank you. Yeah, so, so IPv6 at the moment, uh, we're, we're not, uh, at the moment we're not, unless we, um, we use open source intelligence as well, things like Shodan, Binary Edge. So if we get IPv6 addresses from there, and uh, we happen to be on a VM where IPv6 works, which isn't, uh, isn't always the case with things we right now beg, steal and borrow, we're building our own infrastructure uh, where we should have IPv6 connectivity as well. Uh, then we're scanning that. Um, yeah, the time um, required to do a blanket IPv6 uh, scan is, um, yeah, astronomical. Um, so one of the te problems to tackle is how to identify the live sections of IPv6 versus the, the dead space that is in there that you're just wasting time. And the honest answer is uh, not right now, not really. Uh, and and yeah, we're, we're, we're open to collaboration and, and, and IDs on that. And the, the, the pool server, uh, the NTP server is a good one. We have another question from the room. Uh, hi, um, my name's Carl. I represent no one but myself. But I have a question uh, with uh, trolling online, and especially uh, political trolling being a national policy in some places. Do you have a problem with bad actors trolling uh, uh, potential uh, well, targets, really, to soften them up, spamming them with uh, these sort of white hat notices, maybe even pretending to be you, spoofing you, in order to soften them up for an attack later on, because then they'll just ignore it. Yeah, well, there, there's no accounting for what, what a criminal, uh, criminal does. Um, right now, it's not that much of a problem. Um, but supply chain attacks are, are a problem. So if you look at, for instance, what happened with, with SolarWinds, where bad actors managed to introduce a vulnerability or a backdoor into a patch, uh, that, that obviously is an issue. Um, unfortunately, it's one that we, we have to deal with. Um, if, if we're successful enough, um, sure, somebody's bound to use us in a phishing campaign. Uh, saying you've got a critical vulnerability, click here to patch it. Um, yeah, we try not to, we, we do include links because people want to know information. Uh, our website is completely static, so if you ever get a link from us that requires you to fill in any data, uh, don't. I think that is sage advice. Uh, there was a question on IRC as well, and it's also one that, that came up a little bit uh, during the coffee we had together this morning. Um, now, you are here, you are Frank, you are the IVD, you have presented, and you tell us here, you tell the whole room, uh, you are a good guy. And we should trust the scans that you do, and you are allowed to do scans. 
Um, I think many people in this room would tend to agree with that and would allow you to do that. There would also be people who would ask, who are you? Why should you be allowing, uh, or should you be doing scans? Why should you be allowed to do scans on my customers? And um, I guess the question is, what, what gives you the, the, let's say, the legal power to, to be able to do this? Uh, nobody and none. Um, we're, we're, we're doing this because we think it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, legal, legal power, it, it's, um, yeah, so, so luckily we live in the Netherlands. And, and the Netherlands has, has computer laws that say that uh, it's only a crime if your intention, um, I mean, within, within boundaries, but scanning in the Netherlands within the guidelines for responsible disclosure or coordinated vulnerability disclosure, as, as more politically correct people like to call it. Um, it's okay if your intention is not to breach the systems. Um, luckily, we're in the Netherlands, and, and, and our uh, public attorneys have, have a lenient opinion. Um, if we were um, the EIVD or the UK IVD or the, or the US uh, Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure, uh, it would be a lot harder legally for us to do our work because their uh, opinion of what we do is, uh, is what we're doing is computer crime. Um, so the intention, um, but if I take the Dutch approach and I'm with the Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure, um, it's really about proportionality and subsidiarity. So a port scan happens, and, and is a port scan really a hacking attempt? Well, if, if, if what we're trying to do is, is to warn people about critical vulnerabilities that pose a danger to us, then a port scan should be okay. Now, sometimes to identify a vulnerability, you have to do an exploit. So obviously not okay is DDoSing an, an ISP or DDoSing a system to prove that it's got a DDoS vulnerability because then you're causing damage. Uh, obviously not okay is stealing data. So we have a constant battle where we're trying to keep, uh, a constant tension where we're trying to keep what we do limited enough, uh, make sure it's harmless enough so that uh, the cure doesn't become worse than the actual problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess we have another question from the room. That's Arjen there. Yeah. Um, I have a question about some um, colleagues of yours, I guess. Uh, just the other day, we got uh, emails from uh, Netcraft uh, that are apparently hired by uh, the Stichting Internet Domain Registratie Nederland, SIDM, um, to do also scanning on vulnerabilities. And um, I was wondering if you would know about that and what you think of it and if you work together. Um, so, 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 so you're telling me something new. Um, oh. So, so I, can't, I can't comment on it. Um, wh what I can say is that, I mean, I do, this, I do this in my spare time. A lot of people do it in, in their spare time. And although it's, it's rewarding and, and, and in a sense, um, well, fun is maybe the wrong word, but exhilarating to be in a, in a, in a crisis like Kaseya, um, yeah, th that's, that's what we get in return. Mm -hmm. And in the end, uh, the model we have right now might not be sustainable. So hiring somebody and, 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 and funding and, and paying somebody to do this on a structural basis might be a good idea if that has to take the form of SIDN and a commercial party. I, I don't know, don't, don't, can't comment on that right now. Okay. But I think if we want a structural solution, um, we shouldn't be relying on volunteers, uh, even, even though we're trying to do the, damn, the, the best job we can. Okay, thanks. I guess there's a question from IRC. Yes, there is. Uh, actually, two questions, both uh, from Jeroen. Uh, the first one is, um, what is the problem you're trying to solve? The internet's broken. Okay, yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> Again, no, the, the, the problem we're trying to solve is that um, 
I think if we want the internet to to survive and, and, and be useful, we need to keep it secure. And right now there's a lot of systems out there that aren't as secure as they can be. Um, we did scans for back, back for proxy login, um, the exchange vulnerability. Uh, we did scans on the day the patches were released and you find 40,000 systems, 40,000 IP addresses online with exchange servers mm -hmm. that can be taken over, that criminals can install whatever they want on there. Um, that's not good. That, that means that the internet becomes a, a little bit insecure. And then two weeks down the line, that number decreased from 40,000 to 30,000 vulnerable systems. That's, that's too slow. So ultimately, if everybody took their responsibility and said, that, you know what, the minute I have a vulnerability, I patch it, we wouldn't have to do what we did. Well, we're still the research on zero days, hygiene, so there's, there's quite a bit of problems in, in this space, but we're trying to, yeah, it's a bit asking the firefighters what problem are you trying yeah, to solve? The problem I, is fires. I think the, 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 the additional question is, um, in what way are you different from other parties doing scans on the internet? Because there are numerous uh, people doing scans uh, at this moment. Yeah, so, so we think that uh, one, one of the differences between, uh, between us and, for instance, Shadow Server is uh, we're trying to, to go beyond just keep emailing problems, but, but we're trying to hand people solutions as well. So this is what you need to do to fix your problem. Uh, we're trying to answer questions. Why do we think you have this problem? Uh, if, if you ask us, we'll, we will tell you. Um, the other thing is we don't think this should be either opt-in or opt-out. Uh, if you're on the internet, you, the minute you put a system on the internet, you took on the moral, at least moral obligation to keep that system secure. Um, and that means if it isn't secure, you need to know about it. And if, if your attitude towards that is, I don't want to know, um, yeah, by opting out of our notifications, um, yeah, sorry, there is no opt-out button. Was there one more short question? Uh, yeah, the uh, second question was, um, how do you deal with honeypots? Because when scanning, you obviously run into honeypots run by people. Yeah, so um, right now it's, it's, it's just reporting. Um, it's, it, if your honeypot is really good, we can't see the difference. Uh, and for people operating large honeypots, uh, as soon as we've got our own infrastructure, um, then um, yeah, we can also work on the signal uh, where we say, okay, we're, we've got another scan starting, or um, yeah, fil filter us out uh, on, on that way. 